Scripture reading this evening is taken out of the book of Zechariah, book of Zechariah chapter 1, the second to last book in the Old Testament. Back in my home congregation at KPRC, I have just begun a series on the seven visions of Zechariah. Chapter 1 records two, the first two of those visions. We consider the second vision, which is recorded in the verses 18 through 21 at the end of the chapter. Zechariah chapter 1, reading the entire chapter, the first six verses is an introduction. The verses 7 through 17, it records the first vision, and that's followed immediately by a second vision. All these visions are visions of Jesus Christ and His ministry to the church on earth. This is God's inspired word. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so have he dealt with us. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month of Sebat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were there red horses speckled and white. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, All the earth sitteth still, and is at rest. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these threescore and ten years? And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. And so the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy, and I am very sore displeased with the heathen that I at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction." Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and the line shall be stretched upon, stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Then comes the text for the sermon this evening. 
Then lift I up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the four horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, What come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head, but those are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lift up their horn over the land of Judah, to scatter it. Thus far we read from God's holy, inspired word. May He bless the reading of His word. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, fellow church lovers and laborers with me, the God whom we love and serve is the perfect, wonderful Father unto us, who knows the needs of all his dear children, especially needs and distresses, needs and distresses that are come our way in the midst of our stay here on earth, our pilgrimage on earth, and in the midst of our stay here and our labours which we are called to perform unto him, he sees our sins and weaknesses. He knows our ongoing struggles, discouragements, and tears. And He ministers to our every need through Jesus Christ, our wonderful Saviour and Lord. These truths are well demonstrated in the opening chapter of the book of Zechariah, and as well the seven visions given to the prophet and therefore to the church on earth, the church that is struggling in her labours to rebuild Jerusalem. Seven visions that reveal Jesus Christ and His all-comprehensive ministry for the church here on earth. In the first six verses of the chapter and leading up to the very first vision, the Holy Spirit makes an important point to the church on earth, which is this. She needs to address her sinful weaknesses, sinful weaknesses that have been made known and discovered in the course of labour. She needs to address them by turning from them, turning from sin. And in that way, experience, blessing from the Lord, and progress in her labours. Blessing is enjoyed in the way of a trusting, holy obedience. And then in the first vision recorded in the verses 7 through 17, the Lord encourages the church on earth with two important truths. He says to the church on earth, you need to know two important things in all of your struggles and labours. First one being this, that in the midst of your, all your struggles and your tears, Christ is present with you. He's never absent. He's always and ever present with His church. And therefore, He knows our every struggle and heartache. And not only does He know our every struggle and heartache, He is ruling over us. He's ruling also over all things, all things perfectly and sovereignly for our good. What a comfort. And what an encouragement, therefore, it was for the church then on earth and for us to know that Christ is with us and for us, not against us, but for us in the midst of all our labours. 
The second and third visions in the book of Zechariah are a further development of the first. The third, recorded in chapter 2, develops the promise that is in the first vision that God would return to Jerusalem in mercy. Mercy is the main thought in the third vision. Mercy. God would return to Jerusalem in mercy and finish its rebuilding. That's the third vision. The second vision, which we consider tonight, develops and displays the complement idea of mercy, justice. God's righteousness and justice shown in His great displeasure with those who oppress His people and as well, therefore, shows the righteous indignation and destructive power of His great displeasure. For it sets forth the truth that Christ is the avenger of God's oppressed people. A truth that is most unpopular in the world and in the church world today, but nonetheless clearly revealed in this vision. A prophetic vision which will most certainly and ultimately be fulfilled by Jesus Christ himself. A truth which once again brings us comfort and indeed many other benefits. Consider with me then tonight, Christ the avenger of God's oppressed people. Unpopular truth, certain fulfilment, blessed benefits. The Christ of God and of the Scriptures is the avenger of God's oppressed people. That's the truth, and that's the truth of God's Word, even though Christ is most unpopular. This Christ, this biblical Christ is most unpopular. His unpopularity, of course, is revealed by the many popular Christs that are out there in the world being worshipped and embraced by the world all around us, especially during this season of Advent and Christmas. Beloved congregation, have you taken note of some of these popular Christs that are around you? To begin with, there are the popular Christs embraced by the unbelieving world all around us. The world, of course, has no real love, no love for the real biblical Christ. But nonetheless, will celebrate Christmas. Will do so because it serves their purposes whether it be for their booming profit margins or else for an extended season of fun, fun, fun and partying or else just a simple time of get-together with the family and away from the busyness of work. There are those who think, there are some of those who think that Christ, of course, is a myth. He's a mythical figure and that therefore the biblical story of the birth of Jesus Christ is nothing more than a fable. Still others think that he is real, but just a cute little baby. Nothing more. He's stunted in growth. He's frozen there as a cute little baby to be commemorated, whose birth is commemorated every year. Then too, in the second place, there are the popular Christ, worshipped by misinformed Christians all around us. There is the Christ who is nothing but love, love and love. That is to say, Love at the expense of sin, who will not address sin. Or else, if we don't care for that Christ, there's that other popular Christ who is 
serious about sin, pretty serious, biblically serious about sin, but is powerless to save. He's ultimately dependent upon man's free will to save himself. Dear congregation, have any of these Christ taken hold of your heart and mind this season? Have you been swayed by the world and have you been won over by any of these popular Christ? The Christ of Scripture, and in particular, the Christ of this Scripture is the avenger of God's oppressed people. That's right, avenger. He is so, of course, not because he is vindictive or, or spiteful in nature or essence. That's not, not the case. But he is so rather because he is perfectly righteous and just. And he loves his sheep, all his sheep, every one of them, including the oppressed ones. And therefore, he will not let impenitent oppressors get away scot-free without the execution of divine justice. He is so and will succeed in exacting righteous vengeance upon evildoers because he is all-powerful, because he is absolutely sovereign, because he is perfectly righteous and just, and he is ruling, he's in charge, he's in control of all things in heaven and on earth. Christ, the Messiah of God, is the righteous avenger of God's oppressed people. That is the truth of Scripture. And a concise look at these verses before us will indicate that pretty clearly. For what is in this vision? Four horns. and corresponding to them, four carpenters which destroy those four horns. First things first, the four horns. Horns. Mention that word horns and what do horns symbolize and what do horns do? Well, in Scripture, Horns symbolize power. God himself often appears with horns in many Bible passages, signifying his power. One such one being Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Notice with me, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. And now verse 4, and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand. His is the all-powerful hand. Horns coming out of his hand symbolize the omnipotent power of our Lord. And so, 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 so again then in Psalm 18 verse 2, he is called the horn of the psalmist's salvation, signifying his power. And in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, God's Christ is pictured as a lamb with seven horns. And there he is pictured as the perfect power of God's everlasting covenant of grace. And in fact, the power of the heathen, Psalm 75, verse 5. The power of the dragon, Revelation 12, verse 3. The power of the beast, Revelation 13, verse 11. All those powers are symbolized by 
horns, horns. And in contrast, the exaltation of God's people, of you and I, to dignity and power is described as a lifting up of their horn, our horn. Psalm 89, verse 17, For thou art the glory of their strength, and in thy favour our horn shall be exalted. You and I are powerful in the law. Horns symbolize power. And what do these horns here in Zechariah do? They scatter. Scatter, scatter God's people. That's the emphasis of these verses. They do nothing but scatter God's people. A threefold emphasis recorded in these verses. Verse 19, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And again, for a second time in the, at the start of verse 21, these are the horns which have scattered Judah. And for a third and final time, right at the very end of verse 21, lifted up their horns over the land of Judah to scatter it. These horns scatter God's people. Jerusalem, Judah, and Israel are all various descriptions and references to the Old Testament church. And being a great, great power, these horns scatter the church. In other words, they bring great harm. They bring great hurt. They bring great damage. They bring oppression to the saints and the church on earth. And so oppressed are the saints that we read on in the text that, that no man did lift up his head. Their heads were all bowed down in fear. But realize, beloved, that at, that at bottom these horns exercise their power not so much against the saints and church of God, but against God Himself. God took notice of that fact. And God re records that fact for the church of all ages to know and to sing, to sing throughout the ages in His holy inspired songbook in Psalm number 2. Verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, referring to Christ, saying, let us break their bands asunder. The text tells us that there are Four horns. Four, simply because they encompass all the four directions of a compass. North, south, east, and west. And therefore conveys the truth that God's people were oppressed in all directions. They were encompassed. They were surrounded completely by their oppressors. There was no way of escape for them from their powerful oppressors pictured by those four horns. But very importantly, along with those four horns, we read on in verse 20, and the Lord showed me four carpenters. 
Now, what's the idea of these four carpenters? We read further on in verse 21. Then said I, Zechariah, in the vision, What come these to do? He asked, and he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head, but these, now referring to the carpenters, these, these four carpenters are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah, to scatter it. Well, obviously, these carpenters are sent by God to destroy the four horns. Our children will understand that it's very clear, very simple, very plain. The word carpenters in the original, though, is an interesting word. And the evidence of it's, the fact that it's interesting is that our King James translators have translated it in various ways throughout the Bible. Here, carpenter, but in other places, artificier, craftsman, maker, workman, smith, engraver, plowman. And rightly so, our translators were not being fickle because the main idea of the word is skill. Skill. These are skilled workers. The carpenters are workers of God, skilled in one outstanding skill, just one skill. And that skill is to destroy the four horns. That idea and that meaning is well captured by the Word of God in Ezekiel 21, verse 31. And I will pour out mine indignation upon thee. I will blow against thee in the fire of my wrath and deliver thee into the hand of brutish men and skillful to destroy. That's where we find that root word in the original there. Skillful to destroy. In other words, they are God's defense against the power of the horns. They are the means which he uses to destroy them. Now, verse 21 tells us more about these carpenters. These are means of God that get the job done in a twofold way. First, we are told they are come to fray. To fray is to make afraid, to strike fear. Now understand, beloved, that these oppressors of God's church know that they are doing wrong, know that they are acting against God, and so they have a guilty conscience. There's already fear in their hearts for doing wrong, though of course they will not show it. And now add to that this, that when they see these carpenters arrive, they will be struck with dread, even more dread and terror in their hearts. These carpenters first come to fray. They're going to strike fear and terror in the hearts of the oppressors, pictured as horns. But also in the second place, they are come to cast out, we are told, that is to destroy the horn of the Gentiles. They are come to do that. That's their mission, that's their goal, that's their assignment, and they will succeed with flying colors. They will. They have always succeeded. For underlying these carpenters, which are but means which God uses, it's God himself, that one who is all-wise and perfectly skillful. 
And at bottom explains the skill of these carpenters in fraying, in striking terror upon the hearts of the oppressors and destroying those four horns. Well, like the four horns, we are told that there are four carpenters. There's really precious little to be said about the number four except to say that they do correspond with the four horns, which we had said earlier tells us that they encompass the saints on all sides. So also it could be said in the perfect justice of God, these four carpenters encompass those four horns surrounding them on all sides in bringing terror and dread in their hearts and destroying them. Now, of course, these carpenters could refer to any nation, any king, and in fact, for that matter, anything or any one at all, it doesn't matter. The point here is not identification, but the idea, the idea that they are come to destroy those horns. At bottom, God, through His Christ, will destroy all those who oppress His people. He will avenge them. Christ is the avenger of God's oppressed people. The text sets forth that certain fulfillment of the destruction of the four horns by the four carpenters. And that certain fulfillment was a truth which the saints in, and church in Zechariah's time experienced, had already experienced to some degree. For they had lived through the time when the mighty Babylonian Empire, which had scattered Jerusalem and Judah, and taken God's people captive was itself overcome and destroyed by the Medes and the Persians, the mighty Persian Empire. The book of Daniel in chapter 5 is instructive here on this account. It records that fateful night when Belshazzar, the last ruler of Babylon, holding a large feast and party with all his generals and important court servants and their wives all present partying away. And how on that very night he was killed by the invading Medes and the Persians. He was free. The king of Babylon was afraid, and therefore Babylon was afraid. That very night, by the frightening hand, you recall, children and youth, the frightening hand, which wrote the handwriting on the wall, many, many, tickle you fasten. Way. Way and found wanting. You have been weighed, weighed by God, and found wanting. And that very night, he was killed. He and his Babylonians were cast out that night. But the Medes and the Persians, who scaled the walls of Jerusalem, and ended the Babylonian, the once mighty Babylonian Empire. And the same can be said of all the mighty oppressors of the church of old. Subsequently, the Persian Empire, which continued the oppression of the Jews for a time, that is, till Cyrus decreed to let them return to Canaan, Cyrus, whose heart the Lord changed and moved and turned, the Persian Empire was destroyed by Alexander the Great. And then there was Rome. 
that mighty, all-powerful world empire of Rome, which was so cruel in persecuting Christians. That empire was frayed and destroyed by the barbarians. And still today, the Lord is at work with his skillful carpenters raised and handpicked by him to fray and to destroy all who oppress the faithful saints and church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let all kings and let all nations which oppress and persecute God's people beware. Let them give heed to the warning of Psalm 2, verses 4, 6, and 9. Verse 4, He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Verse 5, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like potter's vessel. Let all kingdoms and nations throughout the world beware. Muslim nations, authoritarian governments, communist regimes, yea, all nations who oppress and persecute believers, heed the warning of God's word. And in this nation, let all the anti-Christian social and political movements that are gaining horn power with every passing year, let them beware. The LGBT movement, the woke movement, and other communist and socialist movements seeking to cancel the voice of Jesus Christ and destroy the faithful church of Jesus Christ in this land. Let these ones also beware. And so also, others who oppress God's people. I refer now to those who are within the church to those who have power within the church, even our own churches, who have done this and do just that. I refer to impenitent abusers, impenitent spousal abusers, impenitent child abusers who abuse their children in various ways, mental abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, impenitent sex abusers, who first abused the power and the authority and the trust given them. I speak of abusing husbands who abuse their wives. I speak of abusing parents who abuse their children. I speak also of, very sadly, office bearers who abuse members. of the churches, the very members that we are called to care for. I speak of all these who have oppressed God's people over the years. Beware. Kiss the sun, lest ye perish from the way. Psalm 2 Verse 12. There is a word here also for faithful leaders of the churches, faithful leaders in the home and family, and faithful leaders in our consistories, in our denomination. That word is this, fellow office bearers with me. We can take a lesson from all that's happened. We need to do due diligence to protect the sheep. And as far as possible, prevent these sorts of things from happening ever in the church again. 
And also, we need to do our utmost in the power given unto us, our utmost to help God's oppressed people. Not hinder them, but help them. For you see, Christ, Christ, who knows all and sees all, Christ to whom all we must come before one day before his judgment seat, Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of this vision of the four carpenters triumphing over the four horns. It is he who has ultimate victory over all impenitent oppressors of his people, all enemies of his church. That truth is recorded in Revelation chapter 19. In that chapter, Christ stands victorious over the beast and over the kings and armies, yea, everyone that oppressed God's people throughout history. I call your attention to the final three verses of Revelation 19, 19 through 21. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. And now notice, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And we're still not done, verse 21. And the remnant. That refers to the rest of the oppressors, impenitent oppressors and enemies of God. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That sword proceeding out of the mouth of Christ is none other than his spoken word. His word his sharp word of judgment, a word that cuts to pieces the guilty hearts and consciences of his enemies, his word of judgment that is already at work in the nations through his faithful preachers who bring that word of Christ, Christ the King of his church and judge of all men. Notice Revelation 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This day, this day of his ultimate fulfillment and victory is sure and certain, for he has already laid its ground and foundation 2,000 years ago by his death and resurrection from the cross. A wonderful victory which you, Georgetown Church, celebrated and commemorated yet again in a most special and intimate way at the sacrament of the Lord's Supper this morning. Feeding on His body and blood, His blood shed for you, feeding on that by a living and true faith. What great benefits. Many, so very many, are our blessed benefits awaiting us in the future in all of their fullness and perfection, but also already being enjoyed by us in some degree 
today. What blessed benefits do we enjoy? In the spirit of the text, we conclude with four of them this evening. Number one, comfort. Comfort for all God's people, especially the oppressed people of God, knowing that final outcome and therefore trusting the God of that final outcome who will see to it that all things lead to their good appointed end. Comfort. And therefore, number two, hope. Hope for all we who love the Lord and serve the Lord with tears in our eyes and distresses amid our ongoing struggles. Hope lives in our hearts and how important that is for kingdom laborers for the Lord engaged in a very, very difficult labor. Hope lives in our hearts because in Jesus Christ we have the victory. Victory in principle today out of the cross and victory perfected in the future. And therefore, benefit number three, renewed confidence, zeal, and courage in all of our labors for the Lord to do what's right, to do what's good, to do what's necessary without fear or favour that is truly pleasing Him. Him and Him alone. And last but not least, number four, a renewed attitude of gratitude to and praise for God, the sovereign God of our salvation who loves us who has written every jot and every tittle of the book of our lives without error. And that includes the painful pages and lines of our life's history. Without error. In His love. For His glory. And for our good. These being some of the blessed benefits that are ours through Christ. I ask you, dear congregation, what is your response? May we show forth the thanks and praise that He hath wrought within our hearts. Live unto Him. Serve Him with fear and gladness. Serve Him faithfully and courageously. And... Celebrate. Celebrate Christmas and the dawning of another new year with a renewed knowledge of the Christ of Scriptures, the Christ of God, the perfectly righteous Christ who is ever with His church, who is ruling over all things and ruling His church, who is absolutely sovereign, who loves you and all His people, and therefore is the avenger of God's oppressed people and the one who have gained victory for us all. Amen. Father in heaven, bless this word. Word which reminds us of truths which are hard to stomach, hard to receive, sharp, pointed truths, negative truths. Give us grace, O Lord, to receive the truth of thy word and in that way be built up in our faith, our hope and our love. Hear us and hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen.